Hello, my friends. Welcome back. We are going to keep reading Ella Enchanted by Gil Carson Levine. You guys see my cat, Blossom? We'll, we'll see if she sticks around. Probably not. But she's laying on the bed. Looking really cute. All right. So um, the last time that we read, Ella had just met up with Char and his knights. They'd all worked together to send away the ogres. And now Sir Stephen is escorting her to the giant's wedding. So we're going to pick back up with chapter 16. Sir Stephen was indeed talkative. He had a small manor and fro, a wife, four daughters, and two hounds. The hounds were the joy of his life. Smarter than pigs, cats, and dragons all rolled together, he said. As we rode, he recounted tale after tale of their bravery and cleverness. When do you think we'll reach the giants? I asked when he stopped for breath. Three days, I should think. The day of the wedding. And we might arrive after it ended. Can we go any faster? I don't need much sleep. Maybe you don't, but I'm eager to get back to those ogres. But the horse needs his rest. We'll go as fast as he'll take us. I kicked the horse, hoping to spur him on and hoping Sir Stephen wouldn't notice. Sir Stephen didn't, and the horse didn't either. Sir Stephen began a tale about exhausted horses and a charge against a dragon. When he finished, I hastily changed the subject. Do you like serving under the prince? Some might not fancy answering to a youngster, he said, but I'm a toiling knight. What's that? Not so noble I can't curry my own horse, nor so greedy I have no time to serve my king. Is Char a toiling prince? That's a good description of him, little lady. I never saw a lad, page, or prince so eager to learn to do a thing right. According to Sir Stephen, Char was almost as wonderful as the hounds. He wasn't only eager to learn, he did learn, and quickly. He was kind. They had departed for a late because of his kindness. The cart of a fruit and vegetable seller had overturned in the road ahead of them. When the seller began screeching that everyone would trample his precious tomatoes and melons and lettuces, Char had us right the cart. Then he spent the better part of an hour on his hands and knees rescuing vegetables. As he rescued me. You're a long mile prettier than a grape or a squash, and you needed a long mile less rescuing. I never caught an ogre so neatly before. I turned the conversation away from me and back to Char. He's smart and he's steady, the prince is, Sir Stephen continued. Too steady, maybe. Too serious, maybe. He laughs when there's something to laugh at, but he doesn't play enough. He's been with the king's counselors too much. Sir Stephen was quiet for a rare moment. He laughed more in the morning with you than in two weeks with us. He should frolic with the young folks more, but they're on their best behavior with the prince. He turned his head. Except for you, little lady. I was alarmed. Did I behave badly? You acted natural, not like a courtier. Manners mistress would consider me an utter failure. I smiled. We spent our nights at inns. The first night, I retired to my room soon after dinner. I set my ogolin wolf on the table next to my bed so he could protect my sleep. Then I opened my magic book. On the verso was a letter from Hattie to her mother. On the recto, one, from the one to the same lady from Olive. I read Hattie's first. Dear Mama, it is, not, is not my penmanship much improved? I have been practicing my flourishes. The words may be harder to read, and writing mistress despairs of my spelling. But when you stand away from the page, is the result not charming? Sir Peter's daughter has vanished. Madam Edith says she was called away in the night. However, I suspect that Madam Edith is lying and that Ella has run off. There was always something devious and deceitful about her, although her father is such a charming, rich man. My new tresses are divine, and I emerged among the other girls again two days ago when they arrived. I suspect my locks may have vanished with Ella, a heartless prank to play on me, who always treated her with kindness but I still hope she has come to no harm and has not been eaten by ogres or captured by bandits or caught fire or fallen into bad company, as I often imagine. The rest of the letter recounted the compliments Hattie had received on a new gown. She ended with a farewell and the largest flourish of all, Hattie. The recto. Dear mother, I've been feeling poorly all week. I have headaches, especially when I read. You always say too much reading is bad for the eyes, but writing mistress won't listen. She called me a little more than an idiot and said there will be no hope for me when I am grown if I don't learn to read better. Hattie says Ella was bad to leave, but I think she was bad not to take me too. Ella did everything Hattie told her to. I wish people did what I want. It's not fair. Your miserable daughter, Olive. The whole page was full of blots and cross outs. Each letter was formed with a wobbly hand as though the writer didn't know how to hold a pen. Poor Olive. Her letter was followed by a sad tale about the genie in Aladdin's lamp. He had been forced by Aladdin's false uncle, the magician, to take up residence in the lamp and had been given power to grant everyone's wishes but his own. Before he was captured, he had been in love with a goose girl. The genie spent his years in the lamp longing for her and wondering whether she'd married someone else, whether she'd grown old, whether she'd died. I closed the book, weeping a little. I wasn't confined to a lamp. 
but I too was not free. The signs of things began to grow shortly after we started out on the third morning. In the past, objects far away had always appeared smaller than objects close by, but now the old rule stood on its head. The trees near us were dwarfed by the trees in the distance ahead. At 10 o'clock, I saw a pumpkin as wide as I was tall. At 11, we passed one as big as a carriage. At noon, we saw a giant. He was building a stone wall out of boulders. It was already twice my height, and I shuddered to think of the livestock it would pen. When the giant saw us, he trumpeted his pleasure. Ugyak! Honk, he called, dropping a rock and thundering toward us, his mouth open wide in a huge smile of welcome. Our horse reared in fright, and I struggled to keep my seat till the giant reached down and touched the beast gently on his muzzle. He quieted instantly and even nuzzled against the giant's thigh. I ope, ai u kubi, screech, u paip o, I said. It meant hello in abdigay. We've come to attend the wedding of Oaxi's daughter, I added in Kyrian, but are we too late? You're just in time, I'll lead you there. The farm was two hours away. Kupaduk, the giant, strolled next to our horse. Is Oaxi expecting you, he asked. No, I answered. Will she mind? Mind? She won't be able to thank you enough for coming. Giants love strangers, he paused. And friends, too. Lots of friends and strangers will be there. We traveled in silence for a while, with Kupaduk smiling down at us. Are you tired? Hungry? He asked presently. We're fine, Sir Stephen said, although I was starving. Everyone is polite except giants. We say when we're hungry. Never mind. There's lots to eat at a giant's farm. Uaxi's house was visible an hour before we reached it. That's her house, Kupaduk announced, pointing. It's nice, isn't it? Enormously nice. Hugely nice, Sir Stephen said. Don't you think so, lass? I nodded. My heart began to pound so hard, I thought it would catapult me backward off the horse. Soon, I might find Lucinda. Soon, I might be free. So, that is the end of chapter 16. So, tomorrow, we will find out if Ella does indeed find Lucinda at the wedding. I'll see you guys then.